Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show. Last day of November. Can you believe it? Billionaire and owner of X, formerly known as Twitter, Elon Musk, unloading yesterday in New York to an audience of stunned lefties at the Deal Book Summit. This is this thing they do every year for the New York Times. They get all these business leaders. And it is amazing when you hear the crowd react to his hardcore honesty. Uh, you'll be on your feet and you'll understand why the leftists were stunned and didn't know how to react. We'll get into what he said. It was a big F you to advertisers who are giving into this pressure campaign by the hacks over at Media Matters. Uh, but this relates to what our first guest is devoting his life to these days. As Disney sees failure after failure at the box office, there's just another one today, the Daily Wire, our pals over the Daily Wire are executing on a mission to provide an alternative in the world of entertainment. I mean, what an undertaking, right? They saw an opportunity, it's a huge space now, left empty by Disney's abandonment of family values. And they have a new comedy movie premiering later this week. Now they, are, they have a bunch of products that are coming out. Some are specifically designed for children. And then some are movies that are non-woke for adults who are just looking to laugh at the insanity around us. And the movie premiering later this week is called Lady Ballers. I've only seen the trailer, it looks hilarious. And they also have another comedy series coming out. And I can reveal for the first time that this animated comedy series stars, among others, yours truly. <laughs> this, is the, this is the acting gig I mentioned to you over the summer. <laughs> I use that term very loosely that I agreed to. Joining me now to discuss it all, Jeremy Boring, co-founder and co-CEO of The Daily Wire and director and star of Lady Ballers. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Millions of Americans earn and use credit card rewards. A few big box retailers wanna take those rewards away. That's according to the Electronics Payments Coalition, a sponsor of today's episode. These are rewards you may want to use on groceries and school supplies, cash back to save on gas and grow small businesses, even travel miles to make memories. The so-called Credit Card Competition Act would eliminate credit card rewards. No more travel miles, no more cash back. Visit handsoffmyrewards.com if you want to learn more. And if you want to help them, tell your legislator to stand up to the retail giants and to support consumers and small businesses. Jeremy, welcome back to the show. Megan, good to be here. I figured if they could, if we could convince you to become a voice actress, uh, then they could convince me to star in <laughs> Lady Ballers. <laughs> this thing looks amazing. I'm going to get to all of it because there's so much fun to, to digest. But let's kick it off with Elon because that's also amazing and a super fun moment. So he's sitting there with Aaron Ross Sorkin, a CNBC anchor, who is a competent, good questioner, it's Andrew, sorry, but fucking annoying. Oh, sorry, was that out loud? He's just annoying, honestly. He's just, <laughs> just I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, he just is. Um, in any event, he he's asking Elon questions about this Twitter boycott by these advertisers like Disney, who sub submitted to pressure from Media Matters, this complete joke of an organization that exists only to ruin conservatives or people who are right of center. And watch what happens, kind of a long clip, but it's worth it, watch. And you're clarifying this now, um, but there's a public perception that that was part of a apology tour, if you will. That there were, this had been said online, there was all of the criticism, there was advertisers leaving. We talked to Bob Iger today. I hope today. they stop. You hope? Uh, don't advertise. You don't want them to advertise? No. What do you mean? If, if somebody's gonna try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go fuck yourself. But go fuck yourself. <laughs> is that clear? <laughs> uh, I hope it is. Hey, Bob, if you're in the audience. What this advertising boycott is, uh, is, is going to do, it's, it's going to kill the company. And do you think that the uh, I, but And the whole world will know that those advertisers killed the company. And we will document it in great detail. But there are, those advertisers, I imagine, are going to say, they're going to say, we didn't kill the company. Oh, yeah? They're going to say... Tell it to, tell it to Earth. Right. And we'll see what the outcome is. 
What are the economics of that for you? I mean, you, you have enormous resources, so you can actually keep this company going for a very long time. Would you keep it going for a long time if there was no advertising? I mean, if the company fails because of an advertised boycott, it will fail because of an advertised boycott. And that will be what bankrupted the company, and that's what everybody on earth will know. But what do you think then of the, I guess and this goes back to the idea to of trust, though. Then and it'll I, be gone. And it'll be gone because of an advertised boycott. But, but you recognize that some of those people are going to say that they didn't feel comfortable on the platform. And I, I, wonder, I just wonder and ask you, and think about that for Tell a second. Tell it to the judge. But the, but the judge is going to be... Uh, the judge is the public. And you think that the public is going to say that, that Disney is making a mistake? Yes. And they're going to boycott Disney? They already are. I'm saying what I, what, what I care about is the, the reality of goodness, not the perception of it. And what I see all over the place is people who care about looking good while doing evil. Fuck them. Okay? So good, Jeremy. So good, right? Epic. Truly epic. I mean, you're dealing with a guy, you know, it's easy to say uh, Elon Musk is worth $200 billion or whatever, and he can afford to do this. It won't hurt him. That, that, that comes from not really understanding how money works. If X fails, it'll be a huge blow to Elon Musk. It'll probably, I mean, it could cost him control of his other companies just as one way of thinking about it. You know, those companies have boards. He'll have to liquidate stock in order to pay back the debt that he incurred in order to buy X in the first place. The stakes are incredibly high for a guy like Elon. It's not, it's not like the money that he has is, is liquid capital sitting in a giant money bin, you know. No one can afford to just lose $40 billion dollars and have that be meaningless to them. It's not that it's meaningless to him, it's that it is of less meaning to him than the thing that caused him to buy X in the first place, which is a commitment to open discourse. So I, I think he's an actual hero. He's, he's one of the great men of our time. I think that he is the greatest living American, as I've said many times, to the chagrin of all the people who try to point out to me that he isn't American, uh, but he is. He is both literally because he's a citizen of this country and he is because there's no other country in the world in which he could have done what he's done and built what he's built. It's so gratifying just to hear somebody mm. say exactly what you feel and what I feel. You know, in our own ways, we've both been saying exactly what he's saying right there. F off, right, to these people who try to pressure us out of saying what we know is real, saying what we know is true, but my God, they try. Yeah. Well, the only thing, I hope that Elon is successful in keeping X alive. I think that it's one of the most important platforms in the world. It actually doesn't drive commerce for my company in the way that other platforms do. They haven't figured out all that monetization yet at X, but it is where the actual conversation takes place. And to have the only platform that really drives conversation in the country also be the only platform that will allow us to have a voice uh, is obviously incredibly important. But I hope he fails in destroying media matters uh, because... If he manages to take out Media Matters, my expenses on publicists will go through the roof. I mean, right now, leftist donors like George Soros literally pay people full-time salaries at Media Matters to listen to all my shows, break out the greatest hits, complain about them, and put them out on social media. I mean, you can't buy that kind of publicity. So... <laughs> Say that. It's true. But, yeah, but let's Look, don't kill Media Matters. Come on. Media Matters, we'll see what happens in this lawsuit, the thermonuclear lawsuit that he filed against them. We yeah. covered it with Marsha Clark and Mark Garagos uh, earlier this week. I do think he has a leg to stand on there. I mean, when you intentionally target a company like X and misrepresent to the public, even though your words may be literally true about what happened when you did your experiment on X, but if they are nonetheless yeah. defamatory and misleading, you actually can be in legal trouble, and that's he's got great lawyers, and that's the case he's about to make. A lot of lies are told with literal truths. Yeah, well, I mean, that's Media Matters, bread and butter. So that's also okay. just for the audiences, you know, as a reminder, that's the, the publication that kept putting out those Tucker videos of him on set getting, you know, like hair and makeup fixed in between the breaks, trying to make him look better. I mean, it, you name the person who is not a lefty, and they've gone after them. And only here yeah. has Disney and all these other uh, advertisers bent the knee. I, I tweeted this out earlier today. These same advertisers like Disney they're, that are gonna pull their advertising and have from X are going to go right ahead and continue advertising in the New York Times, which literally just hired a man who recently posted, Hitler, you are so great. 
that, yeah, that's they'll right. advertise with that organization, but not with Elon's ex, ostensibly because of this Media Matters report and because Elon sent out this tweet where he was saying, he liked a tweet that was controversial in which the person was saying something to the effect of, I'm sick of these Jewish groups who have been on the wrong side of wokeism. This is my own mm -hmm. paraphrasing and now want us to feel bad for them. And he liked it. And he later tried to clarify, he meant the ADL, which is supposed to be this pro-Jewish group, but they're very woke and they're very annoying yeah. and they've attacked well, everybody the ADL, too. The ADL is of a kind with media matters. There's an entire organization on the left, this, this constellation of nonprofit organizations. Uh, and I think important to say, uh, government funded and government collaborating organizations as well, you know, from NewsGuard to Media Matters to, to small operations like Sleeping Giants to the ADL, who essentially exist in order to suppress speech in the country. They exist in order to target advertisers and try to drive advertisers out of supporting people and, and programs like yours or programs like ours or platforms like X. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it isn't surprising that someone like Elon, who's taking actual financial uh, injury because of those organizations, might like a tweet that, that he perceives to be critical of them. You know, even our own Ben Shapiro has made a great defense of Elon over that tweet. It's it's uh, he did. It is a kind of anti-Semitism in and of itself to say that criticism of a group like the ADL is anti-Semitic. It's just a different use of the same kind of stereotyping on the other side. So. You know, I I think that Elon, as I say, I think he's a hero. Uh, I don't know him personally. I've never met the guy. Don't make any money off of him. Um, couldn't look up to him more. He should be a Daily Wire investor. Not that you need it. You guys are doing very well, but he should. Th that should be another platform he invests in. Right now, um, our side of the aisle, meaning truth tellers and people who are unafraid to say mm -hmm. the, you know, the unsayable things, need to stick together. And uh, he's on our side and I love him for it. Um, you guys have seen this problem with Disney that he he's making a reference to Disney there among others when he says, these people who wanna look like they're doing the right thing, I have no use for. I only have use for people who are actually doing the right thing. And that, I, I mean, Disney's Iger. a great example of that. Yeah. I think that Disney's uh, committed yeah. brand suicide. I think it's the worst example we've ever seen probably in all of history. You know, Disney spent 100 years, 90 of those years, they spent building goodwill with the public and the kind of goodwill we've never seen really anywhere else. I mean, states would change their laws in order to support Disney. Why were they doing that? Was there an economic motive? Sure, but a part of why they were able to do it is because everyone loves Disney because Disney has raised three or four consecutive generations of American children with content that parents could trust, that they that would inculcate in kids sort of common American values. Uh, and. The fact that Disney at some point decided that it was better to posture for the woke mob than to be true to that unbelievable legacy is criminal. I mean, in a just world, uh, you know, we'd find some way to resurrect Walt and he'd be able to to put these people in prison for destroying his good name. Yeah, maybe we'll it's do just it. A, he's frozen. Yeah, exactly. He, Pretty sure he's been cryogenically preserved. I think he was, either that was a, a big <laughs> rumor right. or it actually happened, but in any event. Um, so you guys at the Daily Wire actually saw a need for this and started to create yeah. children's programming that is actually for children. It's not trying to indoctrinate our kids in racial uh, mm. ideology or transgender ideology. And the whole entertainment side of Daily Wire is expanding. This is not, this comes to you organically and authentically because before you were God King of the of the Daily Wire, you had a foot in Hollywood and entertainment. So just talk about that for a minute. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that makes Daily Wire unique is that so many of the early people involved in the company, you know, we were an LA-based company, so everyone had dabbled at least to some degree in the entertainment industry. And you know, I, in, in addition to having spent 15 years really pursuing being a filmmaker, I also ran the organization Friends of Abe for five years. So had had a lot of access to, you know, what what was really happening in the industry. I could see a lot of this corruption and corrosion a well, long just, time just before. Well, just FYI, Maybe Friends of Abe was a group of underground Hollywood conservatives who would meet and talk about their thoughts and ideas, but they had to do it underground because, yeah, Hollywood, keep going. That's right. So it's always been on our minds that we would not only build a company that could critique culture, but a company that could create culture. But, you know, you can't leap right into that. It takes a lot of money, takes a lot of reach, takes a lot of resources. And we finally built some of those things and find ourselves in a position where we might be able to launch into this kind of content. And we have. 
to your point, we've launched this brand new brand called Bent Key, distinct from Daily Wire. You know, Daily Wire is very political. Bent Key is not. Bent Key is for kids. And it's wrong to indoctrinate kids uh, into topical politics. Now, it's political in and of itself to inculcate values into children, I suppose. And it's a political action for Daily Wire to challenge a company like Disney. So I, I wouldn't say that there's nothing political about Bent Key, but Bent Key isn't about sort of taking partisan politics and exposing kids to them. It's really about pushing back against the destruction of childhood that's happening in our culture. It's a place where kids can be entertained, where they can be inspired, where they can learn about joy and creativity, where they can learn about wonder. Uh, and that imagination, these are the sorts of things that we're focusing on at Bent Key. And yes, it's because Disney has, has betrayed its legacy. You can absolutely find the greatest content library ever assembled still over on Disney+. Plus. There's shows on Disney+, Plus that you'll want your kids to watch and your grandkids to watch, your great-grandkids to watch. The problem is you can't trust Disney+, Plus with your kids or your grandkids or your great-grandkids because you don't know while they're watching some beautiful piece of content like Dumbo or something, what it's going to roll into next might be an episode of Proud Family where they learn that America is systemically racist and that Black people should be paid reparations for the horror of having to be Black in America. That's the problem that we're pushing back against. You know, we we can't offer right now anything like the, the expansive library of amazing content that Disney has, but we can offer a platform where you can tr- that you can trust with your kids, which is what Disney yes. used to be. That's what and we people, need. You know, like the, the, the inability of moms who are already totally overwhelmed mm-hmm. and busy, like to have that hour and a half break, where you, you can take a shower. Remember like your new mother yeah. or new father for that matter. You, you can take a shower. You've got something. You can put the kid in front of a Disney film and get your stuff done and trust it. And that's gone. We used to have the, um, it's called the extra saucer that you could put your little one in and he kind of couldn't go places, but there are lots of things to play on it. We used to call it the circle of neglect. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no, that's gone. You know, Disney, yeah. you can't trust it anymore for the reasons you're stating. So Jeremy Wire, Bent Key could be our new circle of neglect programming. Well, uh, that's uh, that's what we aspire to do is cause parents to spend less time with their children. Listen, (laughs) we've already scored a huge victory. On the 100th anniversary of Disney, we announced that we were going to make our own live adaptation of Grimm's fairy tale Snow White. And we're doing that in part because Disney's live uh, adaptation of their own 1937 animated classic Snow White, they've been very open about the fact that it would be not consistent with the values of the original Snow White. You know, their lead actress, they Rachel Ziegler, said, yeah, well, she says, I don't like Snow White. It is not 1937 anymore. You know, th- those values are not our values today. And to me, that meant, well, Disney is betraying the actual film that made Disney a behemoth company in the first place. Within 10 days, I think, or 14 days of us announcing that we were going to put out our own live adaptation of Snow White, Disney moved their release date by a year and released a photo of Rachel Ziegler surrounded by quickly created CG dwarves. Keep in mind, we know from other press materials that had been released and leaked previously that there were no seven dwarves in this adaptation that they had already yeah. made that was already in the can. So it, it's crisis management at the highest level. They're backtracking now making this movie. And someone asked me, well, if they backtrack enough, won't that put your company out of business? And I have a little bit of an Elon answer to that, which is, yeah, it would be better for America for Disney to take away the market opportunity that we are trying to capitalize on by actually becoming Disney again than it would be for Bent Key to spend the next 100 years trying to become Disney. Mm-hmm. And I'll go f- just focus on being a lowly shampoo, razor, and chocolate mogul if that's what happens, and we'll call it a great day for America. <laughs> He's saying Until then, that we're gonna make he had to create... Content. He had to create non-woke alternatives uh, in those three lanes, Hershey's, um, razors, and what was the third one? Shampoo, I have wonderful shampoo. I hadn't heard about the shampoo, but anytime a company goes too woke, <laughs> Jeremy creates Jeremy's razors or they're the chocolates and so on so that you have another alternative where you can buy your chocolate or your razors without having to support these woke brands. And you're gonna have to create okay. a soap soon because I'm sick of the damn Dove uh, embracing Megan, every single kind of soap. Com. Go to jeremysrazors.com. My soap is fantastic. Oh, truly. Oh, you already did it. Our, our soap Dove and soap body is wash. ridiculous. Dove soap is out of control. I don't want to think about you, Jeremy, when I'm using the soap, but I'm, I'm going to have to think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but next yeah, I thing I know, like about, Michael Knowles is in there wrinkle. and Ben's in there. I'm just trying to take my shower. Get out of here. 
And that's not a wrinkle I had considered before. <laughs> All right, we're going to come back to what you guys are doing with the new programming in one second, but let's get to some news because there's a plenty of it today. Can I start with this? Joe Biden is um, walking around. My God, okay, wait, where was he when this happened? Because this was absolutely spectacular, this soundbite. Colorado. Okay, so Joe Biden's walking around Colorado and he it's a, a wind facility. He's, you know, trying to promote green energy and uh, a South Korean company. And he pulls this guy aside and I can't count the number of mistakes and bizarre comments in this one little clip, but take a listen to what happened. Hey, Nick. This is uh, Nick oh, Williams. Buddy. Now look, my, my Marine carries that. It has a code to blow up the world. That doesn't, this is not nuclear weapons, is it? All right, okay. <laughs> the cutting them are it's like Congressman Trump and Bo were going. But, but I am friends with your leader, Mr. Moon, you know, home. We're, we're good guys. I said this to Deng Xiaoping and the Himalayas, and I've said this to every world leader. It's never, never, never been a good bet to bet against the American people. Never, never, never. Mm, just, mm. just for those who couldn't hear very well, first he bragged about his ability to launch nuclear weapons and, and the Marine who carried his little suitcase with the codes. Then he called Donald Trump a congressman. Then he seemed to forget the names of the current Chinese and South Korean leaders. So that's what, a 30 second clip for you. It's just a day in the life, but you don't doubt the United States of America, Jeremy. That's our leader. Yeah, don't bet He's against on us. It. Don't bet against us. You know, uh, I, I lost my grandfather this week, my papa, who was oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in, his, in his late eighties and wonderful man and should not have been president because people don't age well. You know, time takes a toll on all of us. And I think that it's horrible what the left has done with, with Joe Biden. The only thing that keeps me from having sympathy uh, for Joe Biden is that he, he obviously wanted this. You know, he, he put himself in a position numerous times to have it. So I never feel too bad for people who seek power. But obviously, this is not a guy who should be running the country. And, and I'd go further than that and say, obviously, this guy isn't running the country. I don't mean that in a conspiratorial way, like he's a puppet. You know, he is the president of the United States and in him is vested the power of the presidency. But that power is only activated if the president chooses to use it. And in the absence of an uh, energetic executive, the executive administrative state is empowered to actually pick up those reins and do an awful lot of stuff. And I, I think it's beyond question that Joe Biden is not only not an energetic executive actively wielding the powers of the presidency personally, uh, but that he's also not capable of wrangling in his current mental state uh, all those other interests who would who would utilize what powers they have. And so, mm. uh, again, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to black pill or or say that you know secretly there's some Illuminati running the whole thing. Uh, but very clearly, Joe Biden is not in, in control of the country, and I suppose we should be glad for it because how could he be? Yeah, but it's, it would be nice to know who is. You know, I mean, we're, we're entitled mm. to know who actually is. It's terrifying to see him up there. I mean, Congressman Donald Trump. Come on, really? I realize we, we, and we played the sound bites of Trump referring to Biden as Obama repeatedly. Uh, that I can understand Donald a Trump bit is, more Donald than Trump is too old to be president. But yes, so you're gonna say it, you're just out there with it, 77 years old, too old. Too old to be president. If you're beyond the average life expectancy of a living American, you are too old to be the president of the United States. And, you know, to say, well, he's not in as bad a shape as Joe Biden, he, he will be older upon ascending to a second term than Joe Biden was when he ascended to this term. So just to, mm. to put yourself in that moment, X year, three years in the future or two and a half years in the future where you know presumably Donald Trump would be taking the oath of office, he'll be older on that day than when Joe Biden took the oath of office to serve out this term. That is just too old to be president. Does that mean I won't vote for the guy if he's a nominee? Well, no, if I have to choose between you know an, an 80 year old leftist autocrat or Donald Trump, I'll take my chances with Donald Trump. But if you're just asking me straight up, is this too old for a guy to be president? Yeah, of course it is. We we should not be ascending people to the presidency who are beyond the average life expectancy. Mm, I don't know. I could make the case, like I, may, I raise him all the time because he's my hope as I age. Alan Dershowitz is 85 years old and he could run circles around both of us intellectually when it comes to memory. I listen to his podcast. He never makes a mistake and they don't edit it, by the way, because you can hear him say, take that out. And they don't. 
<laughs> um, so <laughs> of course, you could use is, a little editing, but he's like, it Dershowitz depends on, on the person. Mental, is my point. I don't think it depends on the person. You, you have you can't make rules on an individual level. You got to have some rules that are just the rules. We don't let you be president if you're under 35. And certainly, when he was 26 years old, Ben Shapiro was 10 years. Uh, too smart to be president of the United States. You know, yeah. Ben Shapiro at 17 could have been president of the United States. But I think it's a pretty good rule to say, no, 35 is is the answer. And I think it's a pretty fair rule to say that we don't let airline pilots, you know, fly into their 70s. We probably shouldn't let, you know, you can't look at some outlier and say, well, ah, Dershowitz, sure. May, maybe it's true that Dershowitz could be president, uh, uh, mentally be president. I don't know if I'd vote for the guy. Uh, but, <laughs> but the exception I, I shouldn't define the rule. I think it's, per that's right. I think it's perfectly acceptable to say that, you know, there should be age restrictions on these jobs. So as you know, Ben and I met when I was on air at Fox and I used mm -hmm. to put him on all the time and he was basically 17 and uh, he was brilliant. And it was obvious even back then. And speaking of Fox, this is my transition. Boy, did they have uh, a problem on their hands last night. I watched this, Jeremy, and all I could think, and I texted this to my team, some of whom are ex- Fox people like me, saying there is zero chance Roger Ailes would have allowed this. These pro-Palestinian protesters who were trying to disrupt the Rockefeller Center tree lighting ceremony, which is mm. just across the street, basically, from Fox. It's all midtown Manhattan. Couldn't get there. And so they decided to make Fox News their staging ground. And things got rather rowdy at times. I mean, I'm telling you, Roger Ailes, who had the second floor, corner window overlooking the front plaza on Fox News, he would have had a security team out there. They would have been dispersed within 20 minutes. Um, it's not, I'm not saying it's Fox's fault. It just showed me like how far we've fallen as a country, as they've fallen as a channel when it comes to the management. And here's a look at some of the scenes in Midtown last night. <laughs> Yeah, so we could keep going. Um, it got rowdy. It got somewhat violent with push, pushing back at cops and look like pepper spray being unleashed on people. Look at this. Look at this. This is all happening stone's throw from where people are trying to see the damn tree lighting. Like take your pro-Palestinian message and shove it. Go home. Manhattan is busy enough. Midtown Manhattan is busy enough. And the Rock Center Trish, Christmas tree lighting for some people has turned into a very special annual event. I'm sick of these scenes and I'm sick of it being allowed. You know, they managed to keep yeah, them I, away from the actual tree, but I'm sure they ruined several people's nights. Of course they did. And I guess they're just mad about that one Jew who Christmas recognizes. Uh, otherwise, there are no <laughs> Jews there for them to be mad at. It's a it's <laughs> the most point. peculiar it's the most peculiar thing to think that they were going to stage this rally. Uh, I mean, I guess it's just to maximize public exposure is what it's really about. But yeah, you know, we we have fallen in love with a really bad idea in the West, and the really bad idea is that all cultures are the same, uh, that all cultures are morally the same, that all cultures are interchangeable, and it turns out they're not. You know, in, in the same way that when I look back at communists in the 19 uh, teens and the 1920s, I have a little bit more sympathy for them than communists on the other side of the Soviet Union or on the other side of Mao's revolution. Because, you know, they were just kind of new novel ideas back in those days, and you didn't know what the consequences would be. Sure, there were people who could tell you, I think the consequences will be that, but it hadn't been borne out. I feel the same way now about this. I, I get it. After the war, we had this very broad, very expansive liberal view uh, of cultures, and we thought that maybe cultures were interchangeable, and we thought that maybe, you know, if we, if we stirred the pot that we could bring peace on earth. If we're still holding on to those ideas now, though, we can look all around and see that it is not true. There are there are cultures that are simply, uh, in their current states, incompatible. There are cultures that are superior and there are cultures that are inferior. And it's not wrong to love your culture, and it's not wrong to want to preserve your culture. And this mass migration of the second half of the 20th century is truly bringing all Western cultures uh, to, the, to an existential crisis. And I don't know what the answer to it is. I fear that uh, that a lot of the people who recognize this uh, this diagnosis are going to come up with really terrible prescriptions for how to fix it. So I think that thoughtful people need to be giving real time and consideration to what sort of moral answers to this might be, because if, if we don't, I'm afraid we'll wind up with immoral answers. But there's no question that we have a massive, massive problem on our hands. You can't have an America that is uh, 
allowing this sort of, you know, well, candidly, people who genuinely hate the country, genuinely hate what the country stands for, uh, to to run rampant through our streets. It's just that is not a recipe for success as a nation. Hmm. I mean, we we don't have it as badly as um, we don't have it as bad as Europe does, but that's no, where we we're going. Not. You can see the preview if you want to see what's going to happen here if we continue with the open border policy and the talk by some on the left of taking Gaza refugees. Um, there was not a single some, Gaza, not a single Gaza refugee should be brought to this country. There is no reason for it. The, the Arab world contains, I don't even know the number, dozens of countries in proximity. If, if refugees need to be moved out of Gaza, they need to go into those countries where they're, where they have more in common with the culture because those countries deserve to have a common culture as well. That's right. Go to Jordan. Go to to Jordan. Full of Palestinians. The queen over there, Rania, she's been all over television saying how sad she is for them. Take them. Go ahead. Prove it. Why should we take them? We're not taking them. Um, I want to say what happened in Oakland, California last night because it was pretty extraordinary. Uh, You you don't have to be uh, an immigrant to on Monday to, to misunderstand America and what happened in connection with our closest ally in the Middle mm-hmm. East, Israel, and the terror attack on it. The amount of nonsense coming out of the mouths of the people who showed up at the city council meeting on Monday was absolutely extraordinary. There were hundreds, hundreds. They weighed in at a meeting that lasted reportedly five hours as the city council was voting on whether they should support this resolution calling on Congress to demand a, an immediate ceasefire, right? That's an anti-Israel uh, resolution. The council voted eight to zero for it. Yes, they want an immediate ceasefire. They're not much interested in seeing Israel end Hamas. And um, the back and forth of those who were there debating the amendment, uh, the, the resolution and impossible amendments to it was absolutely stunning. So take a look at just some of what was said in SOT 1. There's not been beheadings of babies and rapings. Israel murdered their own people on October 7th. Calling Hamas a terrorist organization oh is ridiculous, racist, and plays into genocidal propaganda that is flooding our media and that we should be doing everything possible to combat. I support the right of Palestinians to resist occupation, including through Hamas, the armed wing of the unified Palestinian resistance. As an Arab, asking with this context to condemn Hamas is very anti-Arab racist. The notion that this was a massacre of Jews is a fabricated narrative. Many of those killed on October Thank 7th- Thank you, ma'am, your time is up. Including children were killed by the IDF. An amendment condemning Hamas is bald propaganda meant to- Thank you, your time is up. To hear them complain about Hamas violence is like listening to a wife beater complain when his wife finally stands up and fights back. Question. Did anyone else notice that those who oppose this resolution are old white supremacists? Oh my God. Just a bit of color for you there. The first woman who said there have not been beheadings of babies and rapings. Israel murdered their own people. Um, That is Christina Gutierrez, according to Stop Anti-Semitism on X. She is a program analyst with the city of Oakland, earning more than $151,000 a year in pay and benefits apparently to spew her venomous hatred against Jews. Yeah. Uh, they're not even ashamed of it, Jeremy. They're out there saying it loud and proud. Well, first of all, if in the year of our Lord, 2023, you're wearing a diaper on your face, none of your political opinions mean anything to me. Yeah. Fully 50% of those people are masked like it's March of 2020. <laughs> I don't understand the world they live in. Uh, and then second of all, you know, anti-Semitism is an ancient evil. Anti-Semitism is an evil that can't really be combated through direct action. That's, it's like a lot of slippery evils in that way, because if you go directly at it, you sort of validate in some strange way some of the core uh, and disingenuous arguments of anti-Semites about control and things of that nature. But anti-Semitism on this scale in this country has never existed in my lifetime. It's, it's amazing how quickly it's, it's, uh, arrived. It's amazing how ill-prepared we seem to have been to deal with it. Uh, it's it's disgusting and, and horrible, and it requires you to believe all sorts of other conspiracies because anti-Semitism is essentially essentially a conspiracy of, of its own. So when you say things like the IDF was killing its own children, you know, it's not surprising that an anti-Semite would say something like that. They're already conspiratorial. They're already conspiracy theorists. So they just believe all kinds of nonsense. You should ask that person if we landed on the moon. I'm sure they'll tell you, no, the Jews did that in some secret Jewish movie studio to advance some secret Jewish agenda or whatever it is. They, mm. they 
have a mental illness and a spiritual illness. And again, I don't want that in my culture. That isn't, yeah. uh, it's not American. Israel is, yes, our greatest ally in the Middle East. They're also the, the originators of Western civilization. They're the keepers of the promised land and not uh, of the Holy Land, excuse me. And, and not only that, but if you put all religious and theological arguments aside, Israel's right to exist is essentially the right of every nation to exist. Because if your argument is, well, other people live there first, well, I got bad news for you. Someone yeah. lived every, everywhere first. We should all get out too. Well, listen, That's if right. you're somebody who wants a ceasefire right now, I have good news for you. Cynthia Nixon of Sex and the City fame is on the mm. case for you. She says that she's uh, the descendant of Holocaust survivors and you should be taking her seriously, I guess, because she's the mother of Jewish children. I guess the other side is uh, the descendants of Holocaust survivors. But she really wants, really, really wants a ceasefire. She puts it on her kids. She wasn't able to remember, this is a well-known actress, what the child wanted to say to her or wanted her to say. So she had to read it off of her phone. It was literally like <laughs> one line that was never again means never again for everyone. She wasn't able to commit it to memory. Here she is talking about it and I'll tell you what she's doing to, make, to really make a difference, Jeremy, watch this. As the mother of Jewish children, whose grandparents are reading. Holocaust survivors. I have been asked by my son to use any voice I have to affirm as loudly as possible that never again means never again for everyone. I would like to make a personal plea to a president who has himself experienced such devastating personal loss to connect with that empathy for which he is so well known and to look at the children of Gaza and imagine that they were his children. So here's the good news. She announced that she would be joining the five-day hunger strike that some are going to participate in. However, she's just gonna do the two days of it. I mean, like maybe just, she's gonna skip breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> That's, people have absolutely no, uh, no sense of self, it's amazing. But I, here's the thing, listen. <laughs> Calling for a ceasefire in any military conflict is, is easy virtue signaling. It requires you only to take the position that killing people is bad. A position that is not in dispute by anyone. Yes, when innocent civilians are killed in war, it is an absolutely terrible thing. But that is not the fundamental question. The fundamental question is why is war being waged? And to say that Israel, I suppose, is just support, supposed to absorb these sorts of attacks rather than retaliating because retaliation is terrible is a kind of moral cowardice. It's a standard that no one would hold their own nation to. It's a standard that no, none of these people would, would see through in their own lives. Uh, it's, it's just cheap and worthless virtue. Mm, well said. Stand by, quick break. Back with more Jeremy Boring on the other side of this. I wanna tell you about C60 Power. If you haven't heard about carbon 60 before, it's also known as C60. C60 Power says C60 is a powerful, naturally occurring Nobel Prize winning antioxidant that works at the cellular level. And they say C60 is several hundred times stronger than conventional antioxidants like vitamin C. Now, as you can imagine, not all producers of C60 are created equal. It's very important to go for high quality 99.99% .99 pure C60 and don't accept any cheap knockoffs that are loaded with low quality C60 or made with unhealthy oils. C60 Power says their customers report an increase in energy and mental clarity within 30 days of daily use. If you feel like you're slowing down, could benefit from more mental energy and clarity, and if you're ready to kick brain fog to the curb, try checking out shopc60.com. Use the code MEGAN15 for 15% off your first order. That's shopc60.com, promo code MEGAN15, or just click the link in the description to check out shopc60.com. Jeremy, this just in, MSNBC has canceled Mehdi Hassan's show. The, I think it's fair Aww. to say, biggest anti-Semite over on MSNBC, and there's several in the running, but he, he's number one. Uh, his show got canceled, which is pretty interesting from a channel that has taken a side in this conflict, and it's not the side of Israel. Yeah. It turns out even anti-Israel MSNBC has limits. It's good to hear. Right, right. 
Um, I don't know exactly what they're, they're like expanding. I can't remember this guy's name. Ayman Moyhead. I forgive me. I don't, I've met him once or what is it, Steve? Eamon Moyadeen. Okay, sorry. Apologizes, apologies to him. I have met him once or twice. Um, they're expanding his show. So I think, you know, they're, okay, it's not about me. I don't know what they're saying, but this guy had to go. I mean, he was really out on a limb with some of the more rabid anti-Israel takes and refusing to accept reality on things like the hospital bombing and supporting people like Rashida Tlaib. I mean, I do think that even within the parameters of okay, this is a long conflict and both sides hate each other and I'm just gonna ignore the atrocities of 10-7 and just go like zoom way, way out so I can just talk about what's been happening for all these years. There are limits. I mean, there there really are. And it, you wouldn't know it because Joy Reid still has a job, but I think he crossed him. Yeah. Like I say, I, I've never seen anything like what's happening in our country right now with this, this wave of anti-Semitism. And I think that it probably comes down fundamentally to we've lost all faith in our institutions. We, we're just seeing this sort of corrosion of all uh, social fabric, of all social trust and cohesion. And in that world, it's very easy to imagine conspiracies that don't exist. And you're, everyone's looking for someone uh, to scapegoat. Everyone's looking for someone to blame for their problems. And I suppose that blaming 2% of our population uh, for you know, what, what I've been saying is I suppose that if less than 1% of the world population, less than 2% of America's population, with no organized, centralized institution that they control, no centralized religious institution, no centralized military. If they're somehow able to control all of the, the 98% of the rest of us, good on them. They are good. Yeah, we, we should listen to yeah. them if, that's, if they're that powerful. Um, <laughs> Okay, now speaking of uh, strife inside of a network, you guys have had some of that at the Daily Wire. We've covered it here. And it's one of those awkward things because we love Ben and we love the Daily Wire, but we also love a lot of the clips that Candace puts out. Less familiar with the whole body of her work, I confess, but I love her clips on like John, um, uh, what's his name? Chrissy Teigen and her husband, John. Uh, legend, thank you. And- yeah, and she's great on things like that and some of the culture war stuff. But there's been a weird rift between them over Israel that's been a growing source of discomfort for many of us watching it, where she's gone more and more, it seems to me, pro-Palestine, accusing Israel of a genocide. And everyone knows Ben's history and his connection with Israel and how he's been one of the leading voices to contextualize what Israel is and what, what has happened to it here and how wrong it is. So it culminated a couple of weeks ago with Ben saying at, a, at an event in which he was on cam, I think what she's been saying is disgraceful and that I'm, he's kind of over her faux intellectualism. Then she came out and hit him on Tucker's show. And it resulted in this Twitter exchange in which she um, posted scripture talking about being persecuted and how you can't serve two masters, money and God. Then Ben responded saying, Candace, if you think taking money from the Daily Wire somehow comes between you and God, by all means quit. Then she responded, quote, you've been acting unprofessional and emotionally unhinged for weeks now. And we have all had to sit back and allow it and have tried to exercise exceeding understanding for your raw emotion. But you cross a certain line when you come for scripture and read yourself into it. I will not tolerate it. Um, all very awkward. So I know you've said you're not in a position to yeah. fire or hire and neither's Ben anymore, but that you wouldn't fire Candace. But before we get to your decisions about her, can we just talk about the, how uncomfortable this is and how have you guys been handling it and feeling about it at the Daily Wire? Yeah, I've been handling it by making a movie in Hungary for the last six months, which has been a great way for me personally to handle it. Poor Caleb. <laughs> who's Peace sole out. CEO while I'm out of the country, has really had his hands full. Listen, we, we employ people, give them a platform to give their opinion. We're not always going to agree with the opinions that they give. We empower them to be passionate with those opinions, and sometimes those passions are going to get turned in the wrong direction. And I think that in this particular case, you have two very articulate and passionate people in Ben and Candace, uh, who whose conflict of visions on this issue spilled out into, into the public square, which 
is going to happen from time to time. I'm, I wish it hadn't happened the way that it did, but it's going to happen from time to time. And, uh, you know, I think it just is sort of the territory when you decide to start a media company and give people broad freedom to express opinions. Now, obviously opinions within certain parameters, you know, if, as I said a year ago, if Candace said on the air things that uh, Kanye West was saying a year ago, I I would have to step in or, or whoever was operating the company at the time would have to step in. But that's not what Candace has done. Candace has expressed opinions that I disagree with, opinions that I maybe even very passionately disagree with in some cases, but that's well within uh, her right as an opinion host at the Daily Wire. And, you know, Ben has the right to be upset about that. Ben, you know, I think Candace is wrong when she says, you know, Ben's been acting unprofessional or or, or whatever. He's he Yes, he's emotional. Uh, I think everybody's very emotional. I think Candace is very emotional about the issue. That's why this conflict spilled out the way that it did. But, you know, un- unless it becomes more than that, these are two people who can easily speak for themselves. You know, I don't know that I can add much to, uh, add much to the conversation. I, uh, I don't think Ben's been acting emotionally at all. I have to say, I, I listen to a show. I think all Ben's the time. been the most important. I think Ben has been the most important voice in America and perhaps in the world on this issue since ten seven. I think that I he has almost single handedly uh, kept the focus on this the way that it should be. And I think that he is the most well reasoned, articulate voice on the subject that I'm aware of anywhere anywhere in the world. And not just well reasoned, but of course, as typical with Ben, well informed. I mean, he's the guy. And very well informed. But of course, Knows emotional in a way that we're not used things. to. Of course, emotional in a way that we're not used to seeing Ben em- emotional because it isn't a horrible tragedy that has occurred. It's the worst killing of uh, Jews since the Holocaust. It's the worst act of terrorism since 9-11 anywhere in the, you know, in the West since 9-11. So of, of course, Ben's been a bit raw about it. I think that's actually given him an air of authority and, and, auth- and authenticity on the raw issue. Is it's not- that's right. Yeah. That's what he is. But he's not emotional. I mean, honestly, I've come close to tears many times covering this story. I haven't heard that from him. I've been re- I've been amazed at his self restraint in containing what must be very, very strong emotions for somebody with such an intimate mm. connection to Israel and with so many friends and, and so on over there. So, okay. Bottom line: The Daily Wire is not firing Candace Owens, and Candace Owens is not quitting the Daily Wire, as far as we know. As far as I know, Candace isn't quitting. She's on maternity leave. She she and George oh, had she a, is. a baby, I think, like two days after the Tucker interview or something. Like, again, I was out of the country. I don't know the exact timeline. Um, but so as far as I know, Candace isn't quitting. And no, Daily Wire is not firing Candace for having uh, an opinion that Ben Shapiro disagree with, so disagrees with or that Jeremy Boring um, disagrees with. I, mm-hmm. I my, my encouragement to both of them is to, you know, have these disputes uh, as colleagues behind the scenes and beyond that. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's too charged, right? Sometimes you're ready to sometimes say something to someone else, but you're not ready to say it right to the other. And probably that's for the best. I mean, especially she's she was 40 weeks pregnant. It's like, but you know, Candace goes and she picks these fights, even though she's 40 weeks pregnant. It's not like he picked on her. She, sometimes she's, sometimes she picked sometimes a lot of fights too. Yeah, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And uh, Candace's great superpower in this world, and she's done so much good with it, is her fearlessness in attacking things when she's passionate. And in, in this case, I think that that was a little bit misguided, but I also think that in many cases, she uses that to great effect. Hmm. Well, I think we can both, can both agree on congrats to her and George for their new baby. I'm sure she's home taking care of him or her and uh, wish her nothing but the best. It's, a, it's always rough after you have the baby and you, she already has other kids and she's got a job and it's like, Look, my hope for her is that she can enjoy the holidays and not think about any of this nonsense and just enjoy her new babe. Stand by because next, Lady Ballers and my own debut as an actress. No, (laughs) no, but we will talk about this little secret that we've had, the Daily Wire and I, uh, when we come back. And then after that, in just a bit, Britt Mayers joining us again. So much to get to with her, stand by. Enviro Cleanse never does this. They just announced a massive Black Friday discount. Let me tell you why this is important. They are predicting another triple demic this year. And the best way to fight a cold or flu is to not get it in the first place. And with their limited time Black Friday sale, you're gonna save 35%. So why choose Enviro Cleanse? Because Enviro Cleanse is proven to capture and destroy cold and flu viruses 
other purifiers miss. You know how it is this time. You don't want to get the cold, that nasty head cough. It's like a, it blows your whole world up. Never mind the flu, which is next level. Enviro Cleanse uses military grade technology to wipe out bacteria, toxins, and mold that can potentially make you sick. That's why the Navy chose Enviro Cleanse to protect the air on board America's ships. It's good enough for the Navy. You can try Enviro Cleanse for your home before a virus affects your whole family and takes them down for a week or two. Right now, you're going to save 35% during their Black Friday sale, which is ongoing. Plus, get fast, free shipping. Visit ekpure.com and use code MEGAN35 for 35% off. That's ekpure.com, code MEGAN35, ekpure.com. This is the way the world is now. My eight-year-old daughter told me all about it. So a guy can become a girl with no physical changes at all. Oh, that's called gender fluid. So I can be a woman on the court and a man in the bedroom. I can't believe it. Nice. You mean when you're sleeping? Yes. <laughs> You've got to watch the full trailer. It's available online. Just Google Lady Ballers. Welcome back to the Megan Kelly Show. My guest is Jeremy Boring. He's co-CEO of The Daily Wire and also the director and star of the new Daily Wire original comedy movie, Lady Ballers. Now listen, you can find Lady Ballers starting tomorrow on Daily Wire Plus well, you should go and join up anyway because they have so much great content. I'm a member. I watch tons of stuff that you don't get to see if you're in front of the paywall over at the Daily Wire. It's well, well worth your money and you will be entertained with things like this. So I did not know that you could act, Jeremy Boring. I never really saw you on the screen like that doing your thing. You look amazing. I feel like you really nailed it. You play the, the coach, <laughs> right? The sad coach who really wanted to have more glory on the sports field and decided the, uh, decided the way to do it was to get a bunch of dudes posing as women to form a women's basketball team. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a, I mean, honestly, like a dream come true experience for me. You know, I, I wanted to be an actor when I was a teenager. I gave up on that dream a long time ago because I realized I don't have that much talent. But as we set about to make this movie, we, we called every actor we knew, and every single one of them told us no. We, we called people <laughs> who begged us, like, we'll do anything to work to be in a Daily Wire movie. We called actors who have already been canceled. And I want to be oh. clear, it's not as though they read the script and said, no, this isn't very good. It, this is how the calls went. Hey, so-and-so actor who's already been canceled, it's Jeremy from the Daily Wire. Oh, no, you, I knew one day you'd call. Tell me, where do you want me to be? When and where? I'm in, man. I was like, great, we're doing this movie. It's called Lady Ballers. Whoa, 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 bro. <laughs> I can't do that movie. You know? I'll never That's work again. That's amazing. Yeah. And you, uh, same over, thing over, with um, the talent agency, right? UTA? Was it UTA? Well, the UTA thing happened happened in the past. You know, It wasn't specific to this movie, but they... Uh, a big agent at UTA came to Ben and I and said, you know, we could do really great stuff together. I, I said, no, you can't. We have all these politics. You hate all of our politics. He said, yeah, but we, don't, you know, we can see past all of that. But th the one thing you got to get off of is this trans issue. That's the one thing that'll make you poison in the building. Oh. Because the issue, the, issue, the issue has religious significance for the left. And so it's the one thing no one's allowed to make jokes about. And for that reason, I thought, well, we probably better make jokes about it. And I'm, I'm happy that so many actors turned us down because it became a true Daily Wire production. I mean, literally every talent at the Daily Wire appears in the film. It was an opportunity for us all to work together in this way that we never had before. We had an outrageously good time. It was just nothing, nothing but laughs and physical injuries, you know, for <laughs> 26 straight days. It was... Um... I love the clip of Ben in the trailer as the referee on the on the court, but the, the you will clip not that takes the cake. How funny Ben is in the movie. The, he's a very funny guy. That's one of the things I love about his podcast is he's funny. He makes me laugh. But and his imitations, like his imitation of Biden and Trump, is spectacular. But the the cake taker is Matt Walsh, who definitely would not have been on board with the UTA prescription of get rid of all talk about the trans issue. Matt Walsh. He would not. I was watching. I'm like, is that is that Matt Walsh? Indeed it is. We have just a tiny clip from the trailer cut. Here it is. You can beat them. What do you know about the U.S. Opens for the Global Games? You want us to compete as women. $5,000 prizes. My lover says you were a great coach back in the day. Join. Oh, my God. It was tiny, but I saw it, and I recognized him. That was him, yes? Yeah. Most of the hosts of The Daily Wire have cameos in the movie, but Matt actually has a role. And the role mm -hmm. is he is the, the hippie, uh, boyfriend of coach's ex-wife 
and he is fully on board with what coach is doing. He thinks it's, he thinks it's beautiful. He can finally relate uh, to coach Rob because previously, you know, it was just all about sports and he didn't understand it. But now it's about, he sees him. He sees this beautiful man that coach is trying to make a difference for trans women. And uh, the most, the most fun part of the movie was forcing Matt Walsh uh, to hug me, you know, for like 40 <laughs> straight takes, which is the most <laughs> hugs I will ever, a hundred percent of all the hugs I will ever get from Matt are in this movie. This is going to make leftist Hollywood shudder. I mean, if they had any way of canceling you, they would be unleashing <laughs> it right now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah but know, that's the, as that's the been, frustration as is they can't control by you. Others, I just hope they don't ignore us. Yeah, well, that I, yeah, I don't think you have to worry about that. I mean, I think you'll get very negative write-ups in many places. So that's excellent. That'll work. We've gotten a few. Um, and I would encourage you, if you're just looking for some fun thing to do this evening, you should read or watch some of the YouTube reaction videos to the trailer from the left. It's oh. it's genuinely funny. Their their basic line of attack is the Daily Wire is mad about men competing in women's sports, which does not happen and has never happened. And oh. the reason they can say that is because they have so completely embraced the idea that trans women are women, that then the entire premise of our comedy, which is that trans women are not women, they're men, is a thing that cannot be possible to them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. You've fun. got cameos from people like Riley Gaines who can put the lie yes. to that nonsense that men don't compete in women's sports. Uh, Ted Cruz, I saw, was in it. Uh, I'm sure there's a long list of others and I cannot wait to see it. So if people want to watch it, they've got to go to Daily Wire mm -hmm. Plus, right? Sign up for their subscription. They can watch it starting Friday. That's right. Daily Wire Plus is coming out tomorrow. And it is, if you liked early 2000s comedies, I think you'll love this. Yes. Okay. We need that. We need some body, inappropriate, fun stuff to laugh at. Come on. That's what makes us American. Who didn't grow that's up right. with like porkies? You know, like they don't make movies like that anymore. American pie. I assume this isn't quite that dirty. And anyway, for enough about lady ballers. Okay. Let's get to the big news of the day. Mm -hmm. And that is my movie. It's, well, it's not a movie, but it's a comedy series. It's animated. And uh, this is, this is the film that's going to make me a star. Boring me, me. Yeah. I it's had your to join time. SAG. You've been waiting. You've been waiting. I joined well, SAG join for you. SAG. I'm a union worker really? now. Yeah, I had to. They oh. told me I had to do it. So I got paid well, I absolutely that. Now nothing. I do the whole thing. Yeah. No, this no. was a joke. I, I got paid nothing. I, I don't know what kind of a deal I agreed to. I love The Daily Wire and I love Adam <laughs> Carolla. So I agreed to do this. And I told everybody, I don't know why you want me to do this. I do not. I'm not an actress. They said, you, you'll be fine. So we've so, been working on this you know, show, which is also coming out. That's right. As you know, all I want in life is for you to be on The Daily Wire. Uh, I would take any opportunity in the world to get you on The Daily Wire. It was in no way my idea to put you in Bertram. That, that stroke <laughs> of genius came directly from Adam Carolla. When, we, when he was giving us his dream list of cast, he put together, you know, who he thought should play every role and it came to my desk and right there playing his wife was Megan Kelly. And I said... Adam, I don't, I don't know if Megan is an actress. I'm not an actor. There you go. It works <laughs> right. out great. It was actually very funny because I work with a whole team. We've been doing this for uh, the better part of a year now, taping these episodes. And the guys are so great because they'll give you the line and then I'll say it wrong. And then they'll just tell me exactly how to say it. And I'll <laughs> say it just like that. And they're like, yeah, perfect. Okay, good. So I can imitate but it, we don't have yeah. a clip of it yet. We'll bring a clip when it comes out next week. But it, this too will be on Daily Wire Plus. It'll be on Daily Wire Plus in the new year. It is so funny. You know, uh, it's based on the character Bertram that Adams had going for 20 years now. And he had an animatic for a pilot that he had done, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago for what he thought the show could be. And, and he showed it to me one day when he was in Nashville. And I could not stop laughing about it. I mean, it's all the best things about Adam. It's cantankerous, it's cranky, it's blue collar, it's decidedly un-PC. It couldn't be, you yeah. know, I mean, Adam was, Adam was anti-woke before there was a term woke. Uh, and the show, uh, I, I think, like Lady Ballers, it harkens back to a kind of comedy that we just don't get anymore. And comedies always lived well on television. It's always lived well in series form. And I think that these, these episodes that we did are just going to blow people away. I laughed so hard when I, rest, when I read the scripts. And then I 
the way you shoot these animated series is you're not in the same room with the other actors. You come and you do your part and then they do their part and then they merge the two together. And so I've only seen a couple of scenes here or there. Well, we'll get back together and they'll show me a couple. But I thought it was hilarious because there's one scene in which Mike, I'm Bertram's wife in this in this series, Wendy, Mrs. Bertram. And um, she has a, a fight with Candace Owens. It's not the real, I mean, Candace <laughs> is voicing the, I, I love it. It's yeah. like, because I love Candace. I mean, Candace, Hard we're fine, life. but- we had a little argument on on Twitter and then I laughed because I'm like, oh, people are going to love this because she and I actually have an argument in Bertram. But Adam you know, Anytime that we have these brilliant. conflicts, everybody says that we staged them. You know, you just staged it for clicks. You know, Ben and Candace sat in some nefarious room and came up with this fight. Uh, they'll definitely believe it now when you're having a fight with Candace yeah. in Bertram. It really is it's like we just point. made the whole thing up. It's a good point. Um well, Adam is great because so basically Bertram is this non woke shop teacher who does not understand. There's a guy who's uh, like the DEI guy in his school trying to police everything that Bertram says and does, and Bertram's reactions to it is actually spectacular. I'll read you the the press press release on it just hit. Uh, Daily Wire Plus announces adult animated comedy series Mr. Bertram, meaning it's for grownups. It's not for little kids, but it's not X. Or R rated, Mr. Bertram, created by Adam. Uh, and it reads as follows Just days after dropping a viral trailer for its first feature length comedy, Lady Ballers, The Daily Wire announced today its first animated scripted series, Mr. Bertram, created by Adam. Uh, it features an all star voice cast Adam Carolla, Mr. Bertram, me as Wendy, Tyler Fisher, Alonzo Bodden, Brett Cooper, Candace Owens, Kyle Dunnigan. First of all, Kyle Dunnigan is amazing. The audience so, may remember Kyle Dunnigan. He came on my show a year and a half ago and did those amazing impressions. He did trans Trump, trans Trump. You got to do it. You got to do it. You got, I'll, we'll drop it in. Okay, trans Trump. It's trans. So stunning, so terrific, trans Trump. No. So stunning. No. You got, look, look, you got to vote for me. You got no choice. So funny. I could go on. Danny Trejo, he's amazing. Patrick Warbutton, Jay Moore, Rob Riggle, and Roseanne Barr. Roseanne is in it, so you got comedy royalty. That's right. You know, and that's a testament to Adam. We did a, a series, a limited series with Adam two years ago, and he got, you know, William Shatner and Jay Leno and all these people who would never, uh, you know, go on a, a Daily Wire show hosted by one of our guys, but they were all willing to do it for Adam. People, people in the business just love the guy, uh, and anyone who's ever spent any time around him understands why. You know, he is. He is one of these guys who lives like, he is perfectly Adam Carolla. Mm, like there is yes. no, there's no artificiality about Adam Carolla. And so he's, he's brought this stellar all-star cast to bear. The show is, the show is genuinely funny. And, and like everything Daily Wire has done other than Lady Ballers, you know, it doesn't lead with its politics. It really is, it harkens back to like a King of the Hill or a show like that where, mm -hmm. yes, the politics of a guy like Adam are, are definitely very present in the show. But what the show is about is just, you know, the life of this guy living in the wrong time and in the wrong place, basically. The mm -hmm. shop teacher who who doesn't fit in in the world as it currently is. And he gives us a great opportunity to laugh at it. And your character, his wife, is so much fun because you're you're kind of his lefty wife. I mean, you're- Yeah, I'm you playing a liberal. disagree with him. You're playing a liberal. and And yet she respects and loves Adam. And so I think that their relationship is is sort of a special- relationship in a great way to see how maybe people can navigate those political differences in the real world too. I'll give you one one tease. Um, the guys I've been working with were saying, okay, we need, because you have to do funny sounds when you're doing animation and they're like, okay, you know, make a shocked sound, make a, a horrified song, a sound, whatever. And then they wanted me to make a playful laugh, like a playful flirtatious laugh sound. Jeremy, I didn't know, I don't have that. It's not in my repertoire. I'm like, you're gonna have to change it. I don't, I don't have, I have mocking. I have sultry. Yeah. I don't have playful, flirtatious laugh. I'm just not that person. They had to rewrite the scene for me because of that deficiency, my handicap. <laughs> <laughs> you're a diva. You'll have to, to tune in. With. Oh, exactly. They got my green M&M separated. Now they understand how to treat me when they come for the <laughs> sessions. Jeremy, congrats on all of these things. Thank these you. are exciting projects. So grateful to The Daily Wire for existing and fighting back in the great, great ways you do. All the best. Thank you, ma'am. All right, don't forget, Lady Ballers, Daily Wire Plus, tomorrow. Coming up next, Britt Mayer. So much to go over with her. 
If you are racking your brain trying to think of the right present for someone, you won't go wrong with a gift from Cozy Earth. Whether it's their best-selling sheets, luxury pajamas, ultra-comfortable joggers, plush lounge socks, or premium bath towel collection, you are sure to find the coziest gift for everyone on your list. I own a set of these sheets, the pajamas too, and the loungewear. You cannot believe how soft these things are. Cozy Earth sources only high-end textiles, like premium bamboo viscose, giving the people on your list super soft, breathable fabric, regulating body temperature, and keeping them cozy day and night. Unforgettably comfortable and oh-so-soft, created in an ethical and environmentally friendly way. So give the gift of comfort this season and save up to 40% on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code MEGAN at checkout, and save up to 40%. Hurry, though, this holiday offer ends soon. That's CozyEarth.com, promo code MEGAN, CozyEarth.com. Debt. Oh, it's stressful. You can go to bed thinking about it. You can wake up thinking about it. It can haunt your days. I've been there. I have, trust me. Before I became a TV person, I was a law school student that had 100,000 bucks in debt and no way to pay it, and I was stressed. High interest credit cards had those too. And loans make it nearly impossible to pay off your debt. And insane inflation keeps you stuck paycheck to paycheck. The system traps you. Donewithdebt.com can actually be a lifetime. If you're stressed out about this, listen up. I've talked about my own experience with debt in the past, and I get it. Well, donewithdebt.com has got a new strategy to help erase your debt faster and easier than you ever thought possible. Here's what they can do for you. Analyze all the debt options that you qualify for, minimize your interest rates, cut your medical bills, and reduce debt without bankruptcy and without a loan. But you do need to hurry because some of the debt solutions are time sensitive. Go to donewithdebt.com. That's D-E-B-T. Find out how easy they make it and find out if it's right for you. Done with debt.com, done with debt.com. Joining me now for more on the cultural problems plaguing our country is Britt Mayer, independent researcher on culture, politics, and faith, and founder of Rooted Wings. Britt, welcome back. So that was interesting because Jeremy Boring of the Daily Wire is just saying about how, you know, the left just can't even believe that people are railing about men and women's sports because to them, this isn't a thing because all those men are actually women. They're, they Once they say, notwithstanding their male body parts, their testosterone, how God made them, once they say we're actually women, we must accept it. And that's why we're all bigots if we object. So they're talking about people like Megan Cortez Fields. Megan is a swimmer who is a senior at a college in New Jersey called Rampo College. This person swam as a man for the last three years, according to the Washington Times, and was terrible, was absolutely dreadful. Riley Gaines took a look at this person's time as a man and came out and explicitly said, this person was less than mediocre as a male swimmer. And um, now as a female, as of this year, allowed to join the women's team, is crushing everything. This person is just took home first in a recent swim meet. Uh, let's see, set the new record in the 100 yard butterfly, also won the 200 yard individual medley. Four days earlier, had won the 100 butterfly and was part of the winning 200 medley relay at a different meet. And um, this person doesn't seem to have much sorrow about taking a woman's spot and competing on the woman's team. They put together a video of a day in the life of a trans swimmer and made it public. So we will continue to make it public here. So it's video, they're swimming. And oh gosh, this person's showing band-aids no. on his fake breasts that he's trying to grow thanks to what he says is estrogen therapy mm. and just living up, living it up, Britt, but we're supposed to believe he actually is a woman, notwithstanding the fact that he was swimming as a man for the last three years and is a man. And if we don't believe that, I guess we're bigots too. Yeah. Well then label me a bigot. I'm, I'm at that point now where it's like, just give me all the labels. I will wear them like the scarlet letter, but I'm not going to be ashamed of it. Uh, that's why what Jeremy Boring and Daily Wire is doing is so important because it's bringing to light how absolutely hilarious 
all of this is. Men aren't women. That swimmer is a male. And Jeremy's new video that they're releasing is going to make us laugh, realizing how stupid all of this is. But in the ser- on the serious note, women, little girls, their dreams are being crushed because we've allowed these policies and this ideology to poison the water, no pun intended. And um, that's mm-hmm. that's the hard part of all of this is that, um, yes, it's hilarious in the sense that it's so ridiculous. But in the meantime, actual girls, their hopes and dreams are being crushed because we have somehow been fed the lie that boys can be girls and they can't. Mm-hmm. That's right. So these girls now not only have to swim against a man who's crushing them, stealing their records and their first place medals, but also share a locker room with him. The um, Icons, you know, which has been doing great work and calling attention to these issues, put out a, a reaction to this NCAA swimmer who goes by Meg Cortez Fields. It's a man uh, saying he switched to the women's team and is now using their locker room and sharing hotel rooms with the female teammates this season. One, two women's events, erased a woman's name from the record books in Mm. Pennsylvania just this weekend, saying that the president of the NCAA, uh, Charlie Baker, this is on your watch. This is gonna keep happening over and over until the rule effects kick in as they, they were put into place after Riley Gaines and Leah Thomas. By the way, he says Leah Thomas was his inspo. But we're supposed to believe that Megan, the new Megan, why do you have to choose my name? Um, is somebody mm-hmm. to be celebrated, notwithstanding the fact, look at the tattoo that is on his arm. You tell me whether this is a well person. We'll do a close up of it. And for the listening audience, what it shows is a, a female body on top with breasts and long flowing hair and the hips of a woman with a penis and balls. Ugh. With a penis and balls. This is devilish. Like this is satanic. Mm-hmm. That's how it looks to me. This is this is not a person. That's not a human. Hu- Normal humans do not have these two body parts together that can only be created by medicine, by a doctor. It's not something to be celebrated, it's something to be pitied. I don't I don't wanna attack this this man. I can see he's disturbed, but I want him to get out of our lanes and stop asking me to celebrate what he's done to the female body in that picture. Yes. A hundred percent. And what you said, you nailed it. It is satanic. It's against everything that is real. And that's the problem of this charade is that it's not real. And we are being asked to participate in the make believe as if it's real. And that's the problem here is it's not real. Nothing about it is real. They're boys can't be girls. You don't have a woman with a penis. It doesn't exist. It's never existed. So we as a culture are being fed this lie and being told that if you don't accept the lie, if you don't compete against the lie, you know, if you're a girl and you take a knee, then you're a bigot. No, like we're we're just refusing to play make believe. We are choosing to play reality. That's uh, that's a normal, lucid response to this insanity. But you nailed it. It's um, it's absolutely satanic, and that's not an attack on him. That is real. That's an indictment on this whole in- insanity that is destroying little girls' hopes and dreams. I would like to see more and more athletes and parents of these girls refuse to play. If you see that there's a man that's going to be competing against your daughter, say, I refuse. And it hurts. You know, I was thinking about this. Yes, it hurts in the temporary, right? Like you might not be able to play that match. You not be, may, might not be able to play that game that you've been looking forward to. You might not be able to do that run. But that short-term sacrifice is for the long-term benefit of us as women and female athletes. So I think that we need to start playing the long game here and saying, we refuse to play. We're not We're not going to do it. And we're seeing that happen in the UK. I'm hoping that we see um, more and more of that happen here stateside. Well, you know what else is disturbing, Britt? Because you and I have talked about this issue enough to know from people like Helen Joyce and others who are true experts on this, have studied up a lot on this issue, that... The vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of people doing this are what are called autogynophiles. And that means you're a man who gets sexually off on dressing like a woman or trying to appear as a woman. That's what we believe Leah Thomas is because Leah Thomas's social media is replete with incidents of him liking pornography images of just this kind of thing. And what we know from the experts is that true 
gender dysphoric people, you know, people who are born with this disorder and have it from the time they're very, very young, they don't want to show a penis with breasts. They would never parade around in a woman's locker room with any male organs exposed. They genuinely want to be a woman. It's not about mm -hmm. sexual gratification for them. But then there's this other set, this autogynophile that gets off on it. And that person is not someone I want anywhere near my daughter's changing room or locker room. And that tattoo is, that tells me that this person is an autogynophile, in my opinion. Because why else would he be celebrating the positioning of a penis with breasts on a female body. That's that's an autogynophile type behavior. Yeah, it's it's concerning. And I think what you just tapped into is the fact that yes, there is broken, right? There are people who suffer from all sorts of feelings of not being right in their body. And that's sad and it's it's um a reality. But then there's also this celebrating of what is so unnatural. And that's what we're seeing with all of this, where it's this men who are forcing women to be humiliated by competing against them and saying that they are a woman or to sleep with them in college, like you in dorms or to use the bathroom side by side with a man in a drawer videos where you have guys who are erect in women's bathrooms in a skirt this celebration of something so twisted to humiliate women and to really make women second class again against the patriarchy, right? It's like it all rebounded. So I think what you're um, tapping into is important and I can see what you're showing now. Like we- Yes, yeah, so what we're showing for the Universe. listening audience is uh, yeah. two, two trans contestants in the Miss, you, these, are, these are men, you're looking at men we're, uh, in the Miss Universe uh, contest. It's amazing, Britt, I have to say, uh, unlike, you know, some of these guys, you can't tell. I mean, they could pass as females, but they're not female. Those are men. Yeah, those are men. And that's something I've noticed too, is how it's becoming harder and harder to discriminate against what, who are the real women, you know? And it's that's a scary time to be alive. I think about my kids and it's like, man, are we going to go back to arranged marriages where we're going to fully vet families and make sure that your daughter was born a female? You know, when I competed at Miss Universe, we had to sign a contract that stated that we were a naturally born woman. And at the time, it just, it seemed like, oh, it's obvious, right? There wasn't what we're, what we're up against now. But man, the pendulum has swung so hard to now you have these con men dressed as women competing against women and women continue to compete against it. And that's where I think we've got to shift our mentality to play the long game. And as women say, we refuse. We're not going to, we're not going to do it. We won't compete. We're going to take a knee. And I know that's hard. I competed at the Miss USA level and I know how hard I trained for that moment. But man, if there had been a man in high heels and all of us women had said we refuse, it would have shut that whole pageant down. Yes. And then the sponsors are sent reeling, the director sent reeling, the CEO is. I think that that's the long game is yes, you take the short term, term pain for the long game to give women their places in society back from men again. That's so well said. It's not, with the respect, it's not all about you. There could be a moment in which you use your unique opportunity not to get a medal, but to, to get a medal for humankind, for, for yes. girlhood, for womanhood, for womanhood, you know? Like, think about that. I, I know, look, I was never an athlete and I, I understand how hard they work. And I can't imagine the, being faced with that choice. But once you're faced with it, you really do have a, a huge opportunity, a, an opportunity there to do something extraordinary for your fellow women. Um, it's not just the Miss Universe contest or sports. It's also now happening at women's, and we've talked about the women's sorority, Kappa Kappa Gamma, Gamma women's colleges, a Catholic woman's mm -hmm. college of all places, Catholic women. It's called St. Mary's. It's in um, Notre Dame, um, Indiana. And they are now allowing trans women, meaning men, into the university. They're going to begin allowing men who identify as women, quote, identify to enroll starting fall of 24. The president, Kate Comboy, you failed, Kate, Katie, uh, sent faculty an email saying St. Mary's will consider 
these applicants whose sex assigned at birth is female, which is annoying. They, I used to have to talk like that at NBC, or who consistently live and identify as women, saying this is what's required to be inclusive. And uh, there's some of the criticisms, Britt, have been but from some of the people who are matriculated there. It's no longer a woman's institution. This is fraud. We, we should be entitled to a refund for luring us into a Catholic women's institution the, from mm-hmm. a place that has now abandoned its faith and the woman. These women are now going to have to share bathrooms and locker rooms with men. They chose to go to a woman's university for a reason. Yeah, and probably spent a whole lot of money for that protection. I was looking this up uh, last night. I got tagged on this by a few of my followers. And at first I wanted to make sure it was legitimate because it's like, man, are we at that point now where you have all girls colleges that are saying, Hey, in the fall, we're going to start accepting men who claim that they're women. Yes. It, that's, that's where we're at in society, which is crazy. I do want to point out, and I'm against ad hominem attacks, but did you notice president Katie's last name? I just think it's ironic. Her last name is convoy. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. I mean, I got a chuckle. Um, <laughs> but I had, um, uh, women who have gone to this university tagging me and actually asking, like, can you please have Megan talk about this? So I'm so glad that you pulled this story because it is it is really important and it's hitting a nerve um, out there in Indiana. But I, w- as I was doing my research, you know, this was founded, this college was founded 180 years ago as a response to the Notre Dame uh, University, which at the time was an all boys college. Um, male college. And it was founded by four sisters of the Holy Cross. It was intentionally established as discriminatory against men for women. So it's interesting that here in 2023, we've become so progressive with our policies and our language that Convoy's email that she sent out to everyone at the university um, when everyone was going on Thanksgiving break, she was updating the non-discrimination policy saying, you know, the mission of St. Mary's College is to empower women and it's essential to this mission and fostering a diverse, equitable and inclusive campus experience. And she talks about the Sisters of the Holy Cross and upholding, upholding their vision and values. But in all of this, she's saying that, you know, St. Mary's is choosing not to discriminate. And I want to say, hold up a second. Your school was established intentionally to protect women and give them an option as a discriminatory action against men. That's okay. Like it's okay to say, yes, we discriminate against men. That's what our university was set up for. It was to be an all women's college university for further learning. So I just find her email out here in 2023, you know, 180 years later, um, it's just such a bad take because it's like, well, then just ca- don't call it an all women's college anymore. Right. Just, just say, we're just, we're just going to do, do it all, you know, but don't, don't pretend, don't say that we're doing this because we don't discriminate when your college was set up on the basis of protecting women. And in that, of course, it's discriminatory against men. If you're a man, not, you can't it, join and the it's college. It's like a lot of women do choose all women institutions because they've had issues in their past. They just want to be with only women. Some have been sexually assaulted. Some just want a very safe place with only women where they don't even have to think about things like that. And they're entitled to do that. Same as men are entitled to go to all male institutions and then not have a bait and switch of the kind that we're seeing here. Um, okay, mm-hmm. let me let me turn the page and uh, get to a couple of other things that I wanted to ask you about. My shout out to Lauren LaBruna who works for me, she, my, my producer who found that story, but she also found this one. So this is being pushed by Cosmopolitan Magazine on Instagram. Now, when I was 17, Cosmo showed you how to do fun makeup. That's what Cosmo did. Sometimes it would have like some saucy like tips on how to get that guy. So things like that it was pretty benign back in the day. Um, now they're actually promoting to their 4.2 million followers. What's it like to have a satanic abortion? A satanic abortion. And they're talking about Jessica, name changed, a 37-year-old mother of three who received abortion medication at a satanic abortion clinic. It calls itself, and this is an F-U to Justice Alito, Samuel Mm -hmm. Alito's mom's satanic clinic. 
it has nothing to do with Samuel Alito or his mom. The reason they're calling it that is because they're saying abortion was illegal when Samuel Alito was born and he's case in chief proof as to why it should have been legal. He should have been aborted and then we wouldn't have to deal with him. That's So they named this abortion clinic, Samuel Alito's mom, satanic clinic where you can go and you can really enjoy your abortion, where they're encouraging you to find a quiet space, bring a mirror, just before you take your abortion medication, gaze at your reflection, focus on your personhood, home in on your intent, your responsibility to you. Your abortion should focus on your autonomy in making this decision. Patients can include as many loved ones as they'd like or light candles or even dress up while you're having your abortion, whatever makes you feel empowered. This is beyond. There's no mm -hmm. shame at all. Even if you are pro-choice, you have to recoil from this kind of celebration at what is indisputably the snuffing out of a young, beautiful life. Mm -hmm. Oh, I totally, totally agree with you on this. I saw, um, you know, I went to Cosmopolitan's Instagram and it's ironic that this, they, they actually ran three different posts on how to have a satanic abortion. So it's three separate ones checkered in their Instagram feed. And in between those, they have a post with Travis Barker and what's his Kardashian he's married to. Anyway, mm. she's super pregnant. And I just thought, man, the irony here you right. have like this beautiful picture of, I think it's her birthday pictures or something. And she's with her husband. She's super pregnant. And then it's sandwiched with how to murder your baby and praise the devil. But we're not going to say that. We're not going to go all the way and say you're praising the devil. We're just saying, yeah, it's by my body, by my blood, by my will, it is done. And it's literally, they, they lay out exactly how, how to do this. I mean, it, if you needed an answer to those who say that abortion is not satanic. Well, here, here you go. I mean, they basically just played the hand and said, yep, we are. We're going full satanic with this because we are hell bent on letting women murder babies. I am, you know, I, I am unabashedly a hundred percent pro-life. I am an abolitionist and this actually works in the, my, the favor of my arguments and my defense of saying that um, abortion is and has become a methodology of the satanic. And here you go. Cosmo just put it up for the whole, all the world to see. It's so dark. Like I it's so dark. know women who have had abortions, people who I love and care about. And I don't, I don't judge them. They, they made the decisions that they made, but they would never they would never do this. The women I know mm -hmm. have a fair amount of shame around it, some regret, you know, some don't regret it. Some are glad they did it and whatever that, you know, their professional careers. But even they would look at this as like, what are you doing? You're celebrating? Mm -hmm. Like most women who find themselves in this position feel very conflicted. They feel sad. They don't know what to do. They understand the huge stakes of making a decision like this. What, what grows inside of you to where you could celebrate it while staring at your own face in the mirror, it's all mm. about me and the yeah. devil, right? Like, uh, yeah, it's sick. And There's I a think, sickness. Yeah, and I would say I uh, I agree with you know our generation and the viewpoints that our generation. I had a friend in high school who knocked his girlfriend up, and it was a really really hard conversation. He was a really good friend of mine. They ended up having the baby, but I get it. I get like that feeling of your whole world is going to change. Right. And that it can be really complicated. I think that we are seeing a shift in the younger generation. What you just said with like the narcissism, with the social media selfie world, with the Kardashian world, with where it's all about me, 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 me. And uh, it's, it's, a, I am God and nothing else mm. matters other than mm -hmm. what I want. So my pushback a little bit would be, I think we're viewing abortion from the standpoint of our generation, where I think the younger generation has been fed a much different, much freer story on, you know, if you don't like it, just get rid of it. And it doesn't matter if it's a human, just kill it. Like just, you can, you can go have yourself a little satanic abortion and stare in the mirror and affirm yourself and just get rid of that thing. I think it's become a lot different for um, the younger generation. So my hope would be those friends that you're talking about, the friends that I have, 
to get loud against it and say, um, you know, my experience was this and it mm-hmm. was, you know, Britney Spears, even she just came out. I know yeah, we, talked we talked about, about this that. last time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Those stories are important in um, just the dialogue and where it is, especially with our younger girls. And, you know, it's going to come back to haunt them because you do that and you, you pretend it's a nothing and it's like what, having a period or something like that will come back. Mm-hmm. You, you know, inside, you know, in your heart, what yes. you just did. And yes. you'll have to learn how to live with it and how you acted around it and how disrespectful you were to the life you created. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just feel like that. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I do feel like at least have the decency to be sorry about it. At least have the decency yeah, to, to be shameful about it, it in the moment. Mm-hmm. It may be the decision for you. I really try not to judge people. I'm not in their shoes, but uh, at least you should understand how serious it is what you've done and what you're about to do. Okay. Uh, yes. I want to talk about speaking of these social media lunatics. There, we played earlier in the show, these people out in Oakland, California saying the Israelis killed themselves. There were no dead babies. Mm -hmm. There were no rapes. All of this has been well-documented. And now what's happened is UN Women, which is a group, I mean, the UN is a joke. The UN Mm -hmm. hates Israel and it apparently hates women. Um, Mm -hmm. They have not condemned what happened with Hamas, specifically that Hamas's massacre. And there was an interview on CNN in which the deputy executive director of UN Women, her name is Sarah Hendricks, was asked- hey, this would be right up your alley because the documentation, Washington Post just did a long article about it. Sheryl Sandberg just did a long op-ed in CNN, which was very strong. I recommend it to everybody on the sexual violence that was used as a tool of war against the Israelis. And UN women, hey, this is right up your alley. Why don't you say something about it? Here's what happened on CNN uh, when she, she was interviewed. Is there a reason, though, Sarah, that you can't specifically call out Hamas and the mounting evidence now over seven weeks that Israeli investigators have collected that we've shown our viewers about the atrocities they committed specifically on October 7th? Indeed. UN Women always supports impartial, independent investigations into any serious allegations of gender-based or sexual violence. And within the UN family, these investigations are led by the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. And just to provide a little bit of context in terms of UN Women's role, UN Women specifically provides and has extensive knowledge on gender-based violence and provides and supports investigations as we do with all UN investigations. Oh my God. So consequently, in this context and within the UN system, It is the Independent International Commission of Inquiry, which for us has the mandate to investigate all alleged violations. That was a word salad that avoided the whole, F this woman. She's she's from Canada. She used to run the Bill and Melinda Gates gender equality. She doesn't want gender equality. What? How hard is it to say the serial rape of women? Some of these women were shot in the head while they were being gang raped. It's not hard, Sarah. Find a word or two to condemn it. It makes me so angry. I have been swimming in this research and um, reading the testimonies that have come out from Israel of um, the witnesses to these atrocities against women and um, I've I've noticed how silent so many of these women's, you know, women's groups They've been, their rule have been, it's been silent. So it makes me wonder, even with that word salad, like what, what are you protecting them? There has to be a reason if you're so silent on, you know, I I have so many of these witnesses testimonies, like you just said, the gang rapes, the, um, the testimonies of naked women with sharp objects stuck into their intimate areas of their bodies. Um, Israeli morgue workers who are testifying to the evidence of mass sexual violence that saying we saw many women with bloody underwear, broken bones, broken legs, broken pelvises, and it goes on and on. And I've been swimming in this research and it's a visceral reaction to the absolute evil done against women in the name of liberation, justified liberation from. And I have come to the conclusion that I think the reason why that they're silent is because if they speak, then they're going to have to go on the defensive in their minds against Israel, who they're also saying is the oppress- oppressive colonizer patriarchy, and they can't let go of that. 
they have they have to hold on to Israel being the oppressor, the patriarchy, the colonizer, the bad guy. And so because of that, they're unwilling to stand up for women, which really says they don't give a you know what about women. They're showing their right. cards. They never cared about women. If you can have all these atrocities being published in real time and we're living through it and they're silent, it says everything. It says who they really were protecting all along. And it was it was, it was never, never about, about women. women. Never, never about, about women. women. We were a token, cheap little token that they were using, but they could care less. Well, the same is true for these people who won't speak up on uh, men participating in our sports and our spaces. They're not for women either. They're, they're yes. for some woke ideology that doesn't give a damn about us, which is why I will say, I, I really give a shout out to Cheryl, who is of the left, she was the you know COO of Facebook, now Meta. And she wrote this piece saying, the silence on these war crimes is deafening. Not loudly condemning the rapes on October 7th or any rapes is a massive step backward for the women and the men of the world. They're essentially, she points out, saying these women deserved it. She's right. It's a massive step backward. It's shameful. And this woman, Sarah Hendricks, ought to be ashamed of herself. Um, okay, I wanna get to something kind of frivolous for, you know, while well, in the time that we have, because it's just fun and we need to laugh about it. Wait, first, before we do that quickly, you know, the young Chiefs fan, the Kansas City Chiefs fan who got called a racist because he painted oh, his hat, his face. only took half, half, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, half mm. black and half, half red. And this lunatic writer, Karen, C-A-R-R-O-N Phillips at Deadspin said he's a racist and it doesn't make it any better that it turns out the other half of his face was red. That just shows he's anti-Native American wearing the Native American headdress at the Kansas City Chiefs game. Turns out the kid's Native American. <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. The best <laughs> plot twist. He's actually Native oh, American. I hope. And this asshole oh. writer is still not backing down. He feels he's actually part of a tribe, but he's like, oh, tribe leaders don't like it when you wear the headdress. Okay, Karen. Okay, Karen. <laughs> I love it. I think that's the best punchline that I've seen in a long time. And I love, I think the dad too sits on the board of the Native the American granddad. tribe that he, yeah, I, I just, I love it. I'm here for it. And I hope that they <laughs> sue that guy into smithereens. I, Me I laugh and I love it. Me make too. that guy they the completely... ma make the kid the mascot. You know what the, the team should do? They should give them like, you know, for the rest of their life, free tickets, but make that kid, bring him onto the field, make him a mascot of the team, do something really special and keep that, you know, the black and the red and the headdress and then make him elevate him. That's what, that's how the players, we win is the kid was doing the chop, you know, the chop and the players, yeah. many of whom were black are doing it right back at him. Like, yeah, right on. They weren't offended. Only it. Karen Phillips, who's written everything in his life about race petty, is, petty is offended allegedly. And he's Everything's not offended. Offendable. He's, Right, he's just trying to tear people down. He's decided children are his next target. Good luck, Karen, mm -hmm. F you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, last but not least, there is a huge hit on television. It is called The Golden Bachelor. It's The Bachelor with a 72-year-old guy. And there's a big scandal around it, Britt, because it turns out this guy, whose name is Gary, um, is apparently not exactly what he seems. Here's just a little bit from the trailer of Gary. Listen. Stop looking for the woman that you can live with and start looking for the woman that you just can't live without. I'm falling in love with you, Gary. When the last time that someone said those things to me was my wife of 43 years. I never thought I would see it again. And I'm seeing it and feeling it with more than one person. I just don't have the connection that I did. I'm sorry. Okay, oh Gary, God. that's oh enough. We get, we get the... We get the feeling. So he's I can't been praised. It. Every, every, so um, the, in the write-up of what it exposed, the Hollywood re reporter said, basically uh, he displayed such emotional awareness, authenticity, and willingness to listen that his whole person seemed to have been cooked up in some perfect man lab. They point out that um, Lewis Black joked about him. This guy is like if the word G. Willikers became a person. Well, this thing oh, no. took off. It was it's breaking streaming records for ABC uh, and and on Hulu and the big finale is tonight where he's going to pick one of the last two women who's going to be the Golden Bachelorette or I guess Mrs. Golden Bachelor now no longer one and uh, it turns out there according to the Hollywood Reporter he's there have been all sorts of misrepresentations about his real past they are oh, saying for example Shocker. that he retired he's a retired restaurateur. 
Uh, but really the truth is, I guess he last owned a restaurant like 40 years ago or close to 1985 when he sold his Mr. Quick Hamburger drive-in franchise in Iowa. Then he went on, he hasn't been really retired. He's been installing hot tubs and working as a maintenance man. And it turns out while he represents, I guess on the show, that this is the first time he's really gotten back on that dating horse since his wife died. This woman came forward to the Hollywood Reporter. He's had a nearly three year relationship with somebody. She moved in. He made her pay Dutch on all the meals out. He made her pay for, it was, the expose on The Golden Bachelor may be my favorite story of the week. I mean, it, it shouldn't shock us. I was talking to your producer before I came on about it because I'm like, I don't know. Like, I haven't watched The Bachelor in so long. Tell me about it. So she was downloading like all the info on The Golden Bachelor. And I said, hang on a second. Is it basically, is Bachelor now what WWF is for men, for women? <laughs> like, we know it's fake, it's fake, but we're like, oh, my heart strings. I, I loved Gare, like, or Jer, whatever his name. Like, oh, whatever I'm like, I'm so is. into it. It seems so real. And it's it's totally not. We all know it's completely <laughs> fake. <laughs> they actually went to the trouble of finding old texts he sent to the live-in woman and comparing them to what he's saying to one of the women he's choosing from tonight. Like he texted Carolyn, who he used to live with, damn, I go to bed at night thinking of you and wake up in the morning thinking oh, no. of you. Oh no! On the show, no. he said to Leslie, I have to have you with my morning coffee. I have to have you when I go to bed at night. I love no. you, Gare. I can't wait to no. see who, who picks, who, who he picks. <laughs> Britt, great to see you. Oh. oh, so good to see you, Megan. All right, go find more from Britt at wearerootedwings.com.